Good to see you this morning out to the house of the Lord. What a beautiful worship set. Amen. Don't you love anointed music? Don't you love anointed music, anointed praise and worship? My goodness gracious. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning on a very sensitive subject, uh, and I want to talk to you about the spirit of depression and oppression. And uh, um, it's going to be a little, a little bit different, uh, but, uh, you know, I wish somebody would have preached this stuff when I was growing up in church. I wish somebody would have talked to me about uh, some things. And kind of the way I uh, get messages is um, I, I just think of stuff uh, that, that uh, I'm reading and fi- try to find a way to put it in, in a vernacular that we go through and live in today. And uh, I wish I would have heard this stuff when I grew up, some of the things. And uh, uh, I want to talk to you about that today, depression and oppression. And uh, uh, I think the Lord's going to touch us in this place today. Um, let me say this uh, without going into a whole lot of detail. Ladies, please pay attention to the signs in the restrooms. The end. That'll be it. Please pay attention. It cost the church a boatload of money this last week. So uh, please uh, 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 pay attention to those signs. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 17. I want to read just one verse of Scripture here. 2 Samuel 17, verse number 23. 2 Samuel 23, 17, verse number 23. It's on the screen in back of me, and I'm going to go ahead and go with this. It says, Now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey, he arose and went to his house, to the city. Then he put his household in order, and listen, he hanged himself and he died, and he was buried in his father's tomb. I know this is very strange text, but I have something I want to build off of this today. Father God, I love you and thank you, Lord, for what you do. And I pray, God, that you would anoint me to minister your word effectively today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who loves the Lord said amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. David's son Absalom was going to war against his father who was the rightful king. He seeks advice on what to do. And one of the men of God that he sought advice from, and I can probably not pronounce his name right, and I probably won't pronounce it like I did it a minute ago, but I believe it's pronounced Ahithophel. Uh, His advice to Absalom was this, you do not go after your father, it is not going to end well. Do not go after your father. Thank you, dear. And um, he did not follow the man's advice. He did not follow his advice, and Absalom went after his father to kill his father, and he failed in his attempt. Knowing that this was going to be very disheartening and very embarrassing to Absalom, he knew that Absalom would come to him and figure that possibly there could have been some conspiring behind the scenes for his father to get away where he could not have killed him. So understanding this, the Bible said that Ahithophel, went home, instead of being executed by the king and his army, the Bible said he went home, he put his house in order, and he hung himself out of fear. Now, I think the part I want to get to you the most is he hung himself out of fear of what hadn't happened yet, but what he anticipated happening. And I think a lot of times, a lot of the fear that we have in this life is fear of things that have not happened yet. I think the enemy is the great manipulator. I think the enemy loves to make us look at things that do not, uh, that, that do, have not happened. They're not real. And he gets us worried, and we make, if I can use the cliche, mountains out of molehills. We make a big deal out of something that is not a big deal. Last year, it was all over television on the news and in magazines, a famous chef named Anthony Bourdain committed suicide. How many of y'all remember seeing this? A few of you. He committed suicide. He was worth millions upon millions upon millions of dollars, and he had just signed a multi-year television deal to ensure his wealth for him and his family for the next several years. He had everything in front of him. He was worth millions and he killed himself. Got to ask why. There's a commercial on TV all over Texas here 
that if you need legal help, call the long arm. Brian Longcar. Commercials all over television here in Texas. Uh, overdosed on cocaine after struggling with bouts of deep depression and a bipolar disorder. He was worth millions and millions of dollars. And this is what he said before he died. He said, because the child he had that had just passed away, he said, I cannot find any joy in living. And he overdosed on cocaine. One of the funniest men that ever uh, was on television, my, one of my favorite shows growing up, Mork and Mindy, Robin Williams, the comedian, the actor, I, I just loved his stuff. Um, worth millions and millions of dollars, made, made a living making people laugh every day. That was his job, was to make us laugh. Hung himself in 2014, and then we found out afterwards he was seeking help and going to therapy for depression. How does a man who makes people laugh every day kill himself out of depression? These folks I've just mentioned to you have in the last five years committed suicide and it is absolutely astronomical because all I did was just Google a few things to find out what happened and how many there were and I could not believe, uh, not with car accidents, not because of an infection, not because they went into the hospital and had uh, a botched surgery and something happened, but because of the suicide rates, I was absolutely shocked at the famous and wealthy people that have passed away due to suicide in the last five years right here in America. They had nothing to be unhappy about from the surface and everything to live for. They had family, they had friends, and they had lots of money. Well, pastor, those are worldly people, though. You know if they're not saved by the blood of Jesus, they don't really understand life anyway. Well, let me draw your attention to last year an Assemblies of God official in a foreign nation who was the head over that continent, wrote a letter about how disheartened he was at the actions and the reactions of people who were supposed to be saved. And then he said, and spirit-filled, and he put a gun to his head inside of his Assemblies of God headquarters and shot himself. Reverend Andrew Stokeland, pastor of one of the largest churches in America today, living a plush life. And all you have to do is get on uh, uh, Facebook and get on uh, um, uh, some of the other social media things and see the house that they lived in. Uh, plush life was making millions of dollars pastoring and, and a beautiful young wife and three little boys, the oldest of which was seven in his early 30s. His staff heard a gunshot in the office went running to his office just several months ago, this was six to eight months ago, and found him on the floor with a gunshot head where he'd put the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger right in the church office. It devastated his church of, get this, 15,000 attenders. But they found out that he was suffering from depression and seeking help, and he was on medication for bipolar and he spoke about the rejection he felt from the church members on a regular basis to his staff. Reverend Bill Lentz, pastor of Christ the Rock Fellowship in Wisconsin, very successful pastor, and every pastor has their stand. They have something that they, 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 they dig in on, and mine is relationships. Other people deal with, uh, with demons and occult. Some churches deal with revelation. Well, his stand was on the spirit of depression. That was what he spoke of the most often. And this man shot himself in the head because of an internal struggle he had with his own self over depression. Very, very large church, thousands of people with a wonderful family, great kids and staff. Reverend Teddy Parker, pastor of a church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, had thousands of people. The church was in morning worship, and they were singing praises to God, and he left the stage, went out into his car while worship was going on next to the church, put a revolver in his mouth, and pulled the trigger and killed himself while his church was worshiping. Devastated and shocked, a church full of members who loved and supported him and his family, he wrote a letter that was on his dash and said, the pressure to perform 
to outdo the week before has become so heavy that I cannot bear it any longer. And they found out that he was seeking help and suffering from severe diagnosed depression. And he was seeing a therapist on a weekly basis. You see, what does this tell us? What does this tell us about the world we live in today? It tells me two different things. Number one, it tells me this. In the world or in the church, it doesn't matter. The enemy is fighting and warring in the minds of people today. The second thing it tells me this, it, it tells me is this, that people who are, uh, uh, that, that are doing this are extremely well off most of the time. So it tells me this, that money don't buy happiness. It doesn't. If I could just get a nicer car, if I could just get a bigger house or a fancier house, maybe a little bit more of this, and maybe if I could get just a little bit more of that, if I could just do these things, and, and get, maybe if I could just get that job, I know if I could get that job and make more money uh, and have money in the bank, I would be happier than I am now. If I could get a divorce and get away from the situation I'm in right now, if I wouldn't have married that person, if I would have done this, Maybe my life would be better than it is right now. Money cannot buy happiness. And hindsight is always 2020. Mm -hmm. In studying for this message, I looked up possibilities that cause people to take their lives, and there were five that were listed, and I want to cover them quickly this morning, and I'll try to be brief, and I'll try to be very sensitive to people because I do not want to offend or hurt anybody, but the number one thing they said was a cause of suicide today in America is chemical imbalance chemical imbalance. There are chemicals in the body that control and change the moods and behaviors, and if these chemicals are not regulated and they are not balanced, it can affect the way a person thinks, it can affect the way they feel, it can affect the way they move all different ways. Dopamine is one of those chemicals. It's where we get the root word or the word dope. You've heard they buy dope out on the streets. That is where we get that word. It's a chemical in the brain that gives you a feeling of accomplishment. Your body normally produces dopamine, but in some cases, in many people, your body does not produce the right amount of dopamine. So what happens is you don't ever get a feeling of being satisfied or you don't ever get a feeling of accomplishment when you do something. So they put you on a, a different kind of medicine that will increase the dopamine in the brain to give you that feeling of accomplishment, of satisfaction, like you have done something or you're doing something. When there is an imbalance in the body, dope or other different drugs, they simulate that feeling that is missing naturally and it gets a person addicted to or needing that feeling. So if you go off of that drug, it will mess you up. You have to have that chemical in your body to keep you regulated. Studies have also shown that people who commit suicide, they discover many times that person had very low or very high levels of ser serotonin. Low levels of serotonin will cause a deep depression in somebody's life. Serotonin controls your moods. Further studies show that suicide victims uh, uh, have 10 times the normal amount of chemicals in the body when, uh, when, uh, when, they, when they die. And most of the people that have levels that high, they say are dying of a heart attack. And that is what throws the body and the mind into a war against each other, where Paul says the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh, flesh against the spirit, and these two are contrary. So what your mind says you need more of, your body can't take more of, so the body quits and shuts down this is stuff that goes on medication I used to pastor a man that was having terrible bouts with depression we were very good friends and we still are today he still texts me and still calls me and I told him I believe that God heals by miracle I also believe that God gives doctors wisdom and that he heals by medicine as well so he went and he got on a depression anxiety medicine what happened to my friend after this was he turned very dark he got very dark um, I would I, I need to move on real quick because they watch this on the internet. But he went from struggling with, to, uh, with depression to contemplating suicide. His wife came to me one day and said, I am very concerned about my husband. And I told her, I think you need to go back to the doctor and maybe get him off or get these medications balanced because the imbalance that's taking place in his mind and in his body right now is giving thoughts to him of worthlessness. There is no satisfaction. There is no accomplishment. 
accomplishments. So he's not getting better, he's getting worse. Too much of something, not enough of something can make you sick. I would rather fight in the spirit with depression than to have to compete with meds. Come on, somebody. Hello? Amen. What's interesting in many of the people that commit suicide, uh, uh, many of the people that are committing suicide today is, is they are taking antidepressants. Anybody ever see the commercials on TV? You ever see this stuff on TV? Uh, if you have high blood pressure, take this medicine. This medicine is known to make your blood pressure go down and you to feel like a new man and a new woman. Side effects could be that you die. Hmm. Uh, take this medicine for your cholesterol. If you take this medicine for your cholesterol, your cholesterol will go down to where it's supposed to be. Take this medicine for your thyroid. It'll help you. Ask your doctor about this medicine. It's good stuff. It could make your thyroid function right. It could make your cholesterol go down. It could make your heart rate be where it needs to be. The side effect is you could get moody and want to kill people. Yeah, that's why they talk about all that stuff. That's why they do that. Uh, lower your blood pressure, but you could have a heart attack or have thoughts of suicide. You know what I'm talking about. Some people have taken their lives because of the, because of the medication that they are on. Now, let me talk about this real quick. Bipolar disorders. There are some folks that need consistent encouragement. They need constant encouragement. It, it, it is a process that must happen for them, and without meds, they cannot control the mood swings that they are in. Sometimes, not always, this is related to the DNA in a family. I know some people are going, why are you talking about all this today? I'll get there in just a second. This is why at your doctor's appointment, and some people will argue with me about this, oh, it's not a DNA thing. Well, listen, that's why when you go to a doctor at your doctor's appointment, they ask you questions like, does anybody in your family struggle with, and then they name off a million things, and you have to check off all the things, and they can tell by what your family has done what probably you're going to struggle with, and they know where to start testing you. Come on, somebody. Hello? These are a few reasons why some folks take their lives. Some things that, th that happen are a genetic thing, and some things are in the family's DNA. Now, DNA, let me, let me talk to you about something different. Now, let's go into the, 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 to the uh, generational spirits, okay? Generational spirits follow households, and they follow families. These are called familiar spirits. These are called familiar spirits. Hey, please hang in with her with me for just a few minutes this morning. I promise you, you're going to get something out of this. A familiar spirit is a spirit that is familiar with a person, a place, or a thing. Not all. Listen, not all, but some of the things we face can be caused by demonic oppression. But some things are familiar spirits. Now, let me say this to you. I hear people say it all the time. It's genetic. I'm an alcoholic because my father was an alcoholic or my grandfather was. It's not genetic. There is no genetic link to that. You can't find it. It is called a, a familiar spirit. It attaches itself to families. When you see it and you're around it, that, that's usually what will happen to you because it's what you've grown up with. It's what you've seen and it's you don't break the cycle, it's what your kids will see. And if they don't break the cycle, it'll be what your grandkids see. That's why you can look into families and you can see that the grandpa struggled, the daddy struggled, the kids are struggling, the grandkids. You can see the whole thing laid out in front of you. Acts 10, verse 38, Jesus, uh, uh, Paul, Luke said this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed. He went around healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now listen, there's a difference between oppression and possession, and this is talking about oppressiveness. He went around healing all who were oppressed by the Spirit. May I say this today? Oppression comes from the enemy. Amen. Oppression isn't from God, nor is it something that he wants you and I to live with. And hear me, you don't have to just deal with that stuff for the rest of your life because the Bible said in John 8, 36, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Can somebody give the Lord a hand? You don't have to just live with it. 
You don't have to struggle with it. You can be free. There is a free indeed promise that is there for every child of God this morning. You can be saved indeed. You can be spirit filled indeed. You can be delivered indeed. Not 20%, not 30%, not 60, not 80%, but you can be free indeed, totally set free in an instant because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say again, amen? Now, in my studies, I've also noticed that many times losses can trigger suicides in people. Let me talk to you about losses. <coughs> the loss of a marriage, a husband, a wife. Many times, <coughs> the way to get back at somebody is to retaliate by taking their life. You divorced me. Now I'm going to do this. Live with that. See how miserable you can be now. Now you get to live with the fact that this has happened. A physical death of a spouse or a child. We're talking about losses. I know a man that lost one of his kids in a tragic, horrible accident. The grief and the hurt him and his wife were going through were absolutely horrible. He was a pastor. The grief they experienced over this death has been horrible and it was difficult. He and his wife left the ministry for some time. It was so bad. I had dinner with this man this last week down at prayer conference. He told me, that, and I don't know, we just got talking about some things and I couldn't believe he was telling me some of the things he did because it was going right along with my message. But he said, the Lord spoke to me one day after I had left the ministry and my wife and I had mourned for years about what happened to our son. And he, and he said, the Lord spoke to me and said, son, it's okay to mourn. It's okay to grieve. That is normal. It's a natural reaction to sorrow, to mourn and to grief. He said, but the Lord told him, be careful that your grief doesn't turn into a spirit. See, you can get so lost in grief that it becomes an obsession and a spirit that you will have to battle if you are not careful. The loss of relationships. Let me go a step further. I'll bet this is the most prominent thing today I see in, in young men and young women is they hook up they give themselves away in a sexual encounter. They get bonded and develop a soul tie. They get bonded and they develop a soul tie. Something happens. He walks away. She walks away. He finds another girlfriend. She finds another boyfriend. The young lady gets depressed and thinks her life is over. Listen, because she gave away the one thing she can never get back. And now depression and grief set in. And the enemy makes her think that she is never going to recover from what she has done. Can I just say this to every young lady in this room today? The only thing you get when you kiss a frog is warts. And slime, because they live in lakes, right? They're slimy and you get warts. Prince Charming ain't going to come out of the wart. Come on, somebody. Young men, you, uh, listen, listen to me. I, I, I want to say this to you. Uh, listen, that young man is not going to turn into a prince because he got what he wanted from you on your date. Mm -hmm. Young men, a woman worth having is not found in the back seat of your daddy's car. Come on, she's not found in a club. She's not found at a dance grinding up on somebody or something that's moving. You want to find a man or a woman of God, you find them with their face buried in the Word of God. You find them in the house of God. You don't find them here on Sunday and in the bar on Monday. Woo! Boy, I feel like preaching now. Amen. You look in the wrong place, you, you, you're going to get in trouble. Come on, can I just give you a little bit of Jensen Franklin preaching here for just a minute? Is it okay for me to give you some Jensen Franklin? Are y'all okay if I give you some Jensen Franklin? You want to find a man or a woman of God, find them in the house of God. Uh, I hear the young ladies, I'm a Ruth and I'm looking for my Boaz. Amen. Can I just give you some Jensen Franklin? If you look in the wrong place, you ain't going to find Boaz, you're going to find lazy ass. You're going to find dumb ass. You're going to find crazy ass. Come on, somebody, and whip. Nah, I better stop right there. Come on, listen to me. If you want to find your Boaz, you're going to have to get into the field, get into the harvest, and get into the kingdom of God. If you want to find your Boaz, young lady, you better find a Christian woman called Naomi, a woman who knows who her God is, a mama in the house who knows how to train you right and tell you how to get your Boaz. It was Naomi that told her to get herself down in the threshing floor and, and anoint herself with my God. I'm going to preach and get myself all messed up on Boaz. 
if he breaks up with you, don't let your kids walk out because some of y'all need to hear this, okay? If he or she breaks up with you, they weren't the one for you. Come on, amen? That just means God got something better for you. Yeah, come on. That means God got something better for you. Don't get depressed and start to retaliate. Just look at him or her and say, you want to go? Go head on. You the loser in this relationship. Amen. I'm fine as wine. You, you, you don't even know what you lost. You go ahead and kiss the frogs. You go ahead and be with the little harlots over there. You don't know what you lost. I am the best thing in this house you will ever find. Mm. Jesus, help me, God. Why am I preaching like that? That is just wrong. Y'all like that Boaz, didn't you? Yeah. Now let me talk to you about my battle. I was debating on if I'd share this. <coughs> I remember being the life of the party. I'd bring the dope, I'd bring the beer. I was the life of the party. I loved being around people. Everybody loved being around me. I was fun, and I had a lot of fun. I loved people. Loved them back then. Loved them today. Loved to be around people. I'm a people person. I hate uh, spending time in the office. I like to be around people. It's just my personality. It's the way I am. Just always like to hang out. I got saved, and it was a pretty easy transition. Listen, when I got saved, it was a pretty easy transition. I just changed who I was hanging with and what topics of conversation were and I quit drinking earthly wine and started drinking new wine. Mm -hmm. It was an easy transition. Point is, I still love being around people after I got saved. And I wasn't hung over. I wasn't hunged, hugging the commode. Anybody ever hug the commode in the morning? I threw up so many times, I thought my tennis shoes came out my nose one day. It was horrible. Uh, uh, the point is, I still love being around people and I wasn't hung over and I, I wasn't hurting the next day and wondering what I had done. The problem occurred for me when I went into the ministry. Now, this is going to sound weird, but hang in there with me for a minute. Because at first, when I went into the ministry, I was trying to be the leader, but acting like I had always acted. The life of the party. The one everybody wanted to be around, the one every, uh, that wanted to be around everybody. And let me tell you this, you can't be the leader and be who you always were. There's a separation process. Come on. Uh, I wanted to be the leader and act like I had always acted. Happy-go-lucky, close relationships, a lot of joking around. And I had been warned by other pastors and leadership to guard myself when I went into ministry because it would be a very different lifestyle. And I told my wife, those old fogies just do not know what they're talking about. They've been in ministry for 30, 40 years, and they just have no idea what they're talking about. Brother Blackshear, you just all wet. You don't know. I mean, good Lord. I mean, I know you're 50 now, but you don't know everything. So I would brush people off like that and tell them, uh, y'all didn't catch that. I know Brother Blackshear's 50. Nobody even smiled. <laughs> See, there we go. All right. So uh, I, I just smiled and brushed them off like I knew everything. But the problem occurred for me when I went into ministry. I thought I could do everything the way that I always had done, and leadership told me that I couldn't. In ministry is a life of, let me just say this, fun. Man, there is nothing better than to lead somebody to Jesus. There is nothing more fun than to watch people that you prayed for come in and their lives turn around. There is nothing more fun than to go to where they work and just show up and watch their face and watch the Holy Spirit right there get, get a hold of them. Somebody will say, oh, Pastor John, will you pray for me? I don't walk away and say, yeah, I'll pray for you and then forget what I was going to pray about. I pray right there. Amen. In the name of Jesus, shut up. Hey, you start praying and then all of a sudden you get a prayer line at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> it's amazing. It's just kidding. Anyways, so uh, after learning a few very difficult lessons the hard way, I began to understand why people in my position lived the way they lived. And it's not because you're better. You just can't be one of the guys and be the leader at the same time. So I went from a life from junior high into my 30s where I was the life of the party. Uh, I had always surrounded myself with lots of people and had a lot of funds to instantly being very lonely and at times thinking I had no friends in the entire world, and I couldn't talk to anybody, and I mean, not that I didn't have anybody to talk to, I mean, I could not talk to anybody at all. Because the things that I know, I'm not allowed to repeat. 
So what happens is not only do you have a family, you have a church family of five and 600 people that you know things and you're praying, but the weight of that gets so heavy and there was nobody that I could share the thoughts of my life with except for my wife. And I wish I could tell you that I had never had a bad thought and the enemy has never messed with me about life. But if I told you that, that would be a lie. If I told you that, that would be an absolute lie, and I can't tell you that. I prayed that God would send me some mighty men of David to partner, partner with me. I began reading stories about David's mighty men who lifted him up and helped him <coughs> when he was in war, and God did. I prayed for Benaiahs. I prayed that God would send them to me. I prayed that God would send me some mighty men, and he did. I heard an old preacher tell me one time, in a private closed-door minister's meeting that while he was studying one night, the enemy came into his office and said, why don't you just kill yourself? If I told you his name, everybody in this building would know him. Your church doesn't like you. He said the enemy, while he was studying, came in and said, your church doesn't like you. You shouldn't have moved there. You shouldn't have ever went there. You're not doing anything worth anything anyways. That church don't care if you preach on Sunday or if you don't. They would rather have a guest speaker. If you call, uh, uh, if you call them, they wouldn't be there to help you, and all you do is spend your time helping them. He said it was so intense. He said, I started to pray, and then he said, instantly, it hit me. He said, this is a spirit of suicide while I... I am studying to preach God's word. If I called his name, everybody in this building would know who he is. <laughs> so he said, I started pleading the blood over my office. He said, and that spirit left. He said, and then I opened the door to my office and started walking through the house and started pleading the blood. He said, my wife woke up and said, what's going on? And he said, I'm praying the devil out of this house right now. And he said, I started to pray, anoint the place with oil. He said, I started to pre uh, plead the blood over my children and over my wife and my home. And he said, about 20 minutes later, that spirit left. And he said, and I went back into my office and I began to study. He said, about one in the morning, I went to sleep. He said, I was awakened about two in the morning. He said, and I went across the street. When I looked out the window, there were lights flashing. And he said, a good friend of ours, our neighbors uh, that we knew personally, were living across the street there. And he said, their son struggled with thoughts of suicide. And he said, he went running over there just in time to see them carrying out the corpse of the neighbor's son. He said, uh, uh, what in the world happened? He was trying to figure out what was going on. He said, I firmly believe that this is what he said, that when I cast that spirit out, the word says that when you cast a spirit out, it goes through dry places looking for a place to dwell. And he said, I believe when it went out of my home, it went over there and they did not have, that young man did not have enough of the anointing of God on his life to plead the blood and get it out of his house. <laughs> you see, when I met my wife, I was the life of the party. It almost irritated her because everybody loved me. I, was, I mean, they all wanted to be around me. I wanted to be around everybody. I loved everybody, and, and I was just that way. Everybody knew me, and they loved me, and I wasn't in the ministry yet, but I loved everybody, and I wanted to be around everybody. I had so much fun. And right after we were married, or a few months before the Lord called me into ministry, there were still so, uh, uh, things were still good, but a few years later, the loneliness and the depression hit me like I have never been hit with anything in my life and it wasn't a day or two it was five or six years that I did not understand what was going on in my mind and I would get up and sing and I would get up and preach but still when I got done that spirit was so heavy on me. My poor wife was stuck living with a man that she didn't know how to deal with. My wife married a guy that was happy-go-lucky and wanted to be around everybody and wound up in a ministry that she didn't know she was going to go into and having to deal with a man who was now suffering from depression. And she had to help me come out of the cave I was in. And the Bible says, hear me now, if you're going to find a wife, you need to get a good one. Come on. If you're going to find a husband, you need to get a good one. Don't find Hormone Harry who wants to bed you. Come on. Find somebody who wants to study the word of God with you, who will live right with you. The Bible said if one can put a 1,000 to flight, two could put 10,000 to flight. Listen, I needed somebody to be a helpmate who would help me run the devil off, and God gave me the right person when I got on the same page as her. Come on, somebody. Where two or three are gathered together in his name. Come on, he's in the midst. Now, spiritual reasons for depression. All right, I want to switch gears and talk about the spiritual side of why people take their lives. Been doing some research, 
in, in doing a lot of study on this for the last couple of weeks, and I think I have found a way to explain this. <laughs> I feel like God gave some of this to me. So if you have your Bibles, look at Proverbs 13, verse number 12. I, I think we have it up here, spiritual reasons for depression. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. The word deferred in the Hebrew means to draw out or to delay something. So the way to say this, maybe we would say it like this, when you don't feel any hope for a long period of times, it makes your heart sick. The word deferred, hope deferred, it means long periods of time. When you don't feel hope for long periods of time, it makes the heart sick. Does that make anybody any sense to anybody? All right. The Hebrew meaning for the word sick in the verse is to rub until it is worn. To rub until it's worn. I have a piece of paper taped up here, and it has been here probably two years now, and it says Legacy Church, our mission we exist to connect people to Jesus and to each other. We had to put it here because I kept forgetting and Bob couldn't read the back wall. His eyes are worse than mine. And our motto is we are more than a church, we are a family, and our core values are we care, we pray, we equip, we reach, and we honor. I keep that right here. But if you were to come up here and see this, you would see that this thing is ripped and torn and faded and there's all kinds of, it's, it's all tore up and it's been rode all over because the word sick now listen to this, the word sick in the verse means to rub or to touch something long enough to where it gets worn. There's nothing left of it. Are you following me? All right? If I was to take my Bible, and I just bought a new one that I love, and, and I was to rub that top cover all day long for two or three weeks, I would rub a hole in it, never stop, 24-7, just keep rubbing. If you have a drip of water that drips on asphalt, think about this, for a long period of time, the water drips on that for a long period of time, it will poke a hole through the blacktop. Now that's hard to believe, even after it's sealed, but a drop of water for long periods of time can poke a hole in the blacktop. So listen, hope that is, where, where there is no hope for a long period of time it makes your heart worn. Where there is no hope for a long period of time, it makes your heart sick or worn. You can't even make yourself hope anymore. The other day, I got a small stone in my shoe. <coughs> Craziest thing in the world. And I was walking all day long, and that thing was bugging me. You know how you, you're sitting talking to somebody, and you got something on your foot, and you, you're trying to move it around with your big toe? And I was sitting there trying to move it around, trying to knock that dumb, and I'd do my foot like this, and, you know, every now and then I'd lean against the wall. And, I, and, and the, whole, the, the easiest thing to do would have been this right here. Just pull your shoe off and dump it out. And, did you see that? Fly? Anyway, uh, you, you just pull your shoe off and dump out whatever's in there. So I, after uh, the end of the day, I was getting so aggravated. I just walked in the house and don't normally wear my shoes in the house. And I'm like, man, I don't know what in the world that thing is, but I am getting rid of it. And I pulled my shoe off and I dumped that thing out and there was barely, barely a flake of a rock in my shoe that made me so uncomfortable. I couldn't stand it. That little bitty flake of a rock made me so uncomfortable. I was walking like this all day going, it just drove me crazy. Anybody else ever do that before? Here's the point Solomon was making. When you don't feel hope for long periods of time, it'll cause your mind to be worn down. It creates feelings of hopelessness in people's mind when we don't feel any hope. So here's what happens. Our perception becomes this. It's never going to get any better and there's no way out. There's no fix to the problem I'm facing. There is no way out of the money crisis. I've done. If somebody gives me money, it's not going to fix it. All it's going to do is put a band-aid over the cancer. It's never going to get any better. My marriage is always going to be the way it's going to be. My child will never get delivered. They're never going to be normal. They're never going to think right again. Hope deferred. Long periods of time where there are no hope it makes the heart sick Romans chapter 4 verse number 18 who contrary to hope in hope believed 
so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being, and be, and not being weak in faith, <clears throat> he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that he who had promised was able to perform and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. I want to say this to somebody in here. Even when it's not happening, you have a hope in Jesus Christ. Even when you can't see an answer in front of you, there is always a hope in Jesus Christ. He is always working even when you don't see it. Don't you give up. Tell yourself, you will not give up. Write it on your mirror with lipstick. Put it on your mirror on a piece of paper. I will not give up. I know a man right now who has cancer and he will not give up. He still goes to work. He fights hard every day in his body and he says, I will not quit as long as I have strength in my body. I'm not doing anything. I will not quit. I'm going to keep pushing. And doctors tell you that when people are given a bad prognosis and they feel no hope, the body begins to deteriorate. But when they feel hope inside, they keep pushing and they keep going. And then they say things like this. They should have died 10 years ago. And I don't know how he keeps on going. I'll tell you how. Because hope deferred makes the heart sick. Where there is no hope for long periods of time, you lose everything. But when you have a hope in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you can overcome your mountain mm. Lord help me I got to finish this what time is it I got 10 minutes the alone principle <laughs> most people who take their lives usually are lonely and they separate themselves from family the condition of hopelessness causes them to separate and isolate away from people we were created for relationship. Come on, somebody say amen. During creation, Adam was surrounded by elephants, monkeys, bears, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. He was surrounded by all these different things. And God said when he saw Adam after the, everything was created, and he named it, God said, it is not good that man be alone. The word alone is actually two words. It's a, it, it's a, a, a conjunction. It's all one, alone, all one. It is not good for man to be alone. God created a, uh, an animal. He created a male and a female, and they populated. He said, it is not good for man to be all one, alone. Why? Because if man could reproduce by himself, he saw that to be a problem, so he created a helper. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. We need relationship. Come on, somebody, amen? We need relationship. The reason it's not good for man to be alone is because you'll go into isolation. Your imagination, when you go into isolation on your island, your imagination begins to take over at that time. Come on, somebody say amen. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, I'm going to mess with some of you for a minute, okay? Y'all ready? There is very little downtime for me in a day. Very little downtime for me in a day. Why? Because when I have downtime, that's when the enemy starts messing with me. When, when I have downtime, that's when the enemy starts talking to me. That's why it's so easy to do right when you're at church where the people are that love you, but when you're alone. Mm, come on, when you're alone, temptation is worse when you're alone. Depression is stronger when you're by yourself. Can I say this to you this morning? God wanted a family. God wanted a family. That's why the Bible said <laughs> that he called the angels the sons of God in Genesis 6. God called Israel his son in Exodus 4. God called Adam his son in Luke 3. God called Christ his son all through the word. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Why, does, why did God call everybody sons? Because God wants family. Why does God want family? Because God is love. And when you know what love is, you have to give it away. We were created for connectivity. Anybody who knows anything about love knows that you must have relationships, the five love languages. You have to be able to give something. God created us not to be alone, not to be all one. Come on, somebody. Amen. David was alone when Israel was fighting, and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath. Come on, somebody. And then he had an affair, and he killed her because he wasn't prayed up and out there fighting on the battlefield with everybody else. It happened when he was alone. 
Mm -hmm. Jacob was left alone and he wrestled with the man. Listen, when you are by yourself, that is the time the enemy will attack you. Why? Because your mind is the battleground. And if you will allow him, he will mess with you on levels you have never thought. There will be things that run through your mind if you are left alone, if you're not careful. The enemy will get you to think, hey, David, how you doing? doing? And, and then when you're alone, the enemy will go, why did pastor ask you how you're doing? I wonder if he knows something. I wonder what he was saying. I wonder why he said it like that. Did you hear the tone he said? It in. I wonder when pastor was talking to me, Jeremiah, I saw him look over at Eric. He was looking over at Eric. Maybe he didn't want to talk to me. Maybe he really wanted to talk to Eric or I'm talking to Jeremiah and I happen to look over the corner of my eye at Eric and Eric starts going, you know, I, they're talking about me. Listen, you're not that important. Nobody's talking about you. We were having a conversation and my eyes wandered. I can be talking to Ross and say, hey, Ross, how you doing? Look over at David a minute. Hey, that's great, man. I'm glad to hear it. Look over at Ryan a minute. And Ryan's going, he's talking about us. I can't believe he's talking about us. Christina, did you see pastor talking about us? He was talking about us. And then you go home and go, I can't believe he was uh, talking to me and looking at somebody else. This is ridiculous. Daria, can you believe that I was talking to you and I looked over at Don? He was talking to me, but he looked at Don. That is not right. I'm telling you, the enemy will get you alone and he will get you to start thinking all kinds of crazy things like, what did she mean by that? What did he mean by that? What was going on? You see, that's why it's not good to be alone. When you isolate yourself, your mind begins to wander and go all over the place. And you will begin to think that every conversation is about you. And you'll think that everything going wrong is about you. And then you'll start to wonder and read into situations like, I wonder what was really meant by that. <laughs> I'm in my office. I call it my cave. 10, 12 hours a day. I can go in there and if nobody shows up, I'm a happy guy. I, it doesn't, I don't have to have anybody in there. I, it, just, it just does me good to sit by myself. I get up and walk around the church. I walk around the churchyard, and I think for a few minutes, get my eyes focused on something other than the computer screen, and then I get back in my Word, and I go study some more. That's just what I do. Very few times will you ever walk in my office, and I'm sitting there doing absolutely nothing, clipping my nails, doing so. I just don't do that. Because if I slow down, my mind begins to wander. Why did they tweet that? Why did they say that? I'm in the middle of three different books right now. Three. I take notes as I go. I'm in the middle of three books. I spend a lot of time. And, and, and when, when the enemy starts to mess with me, I want to I help you. Okay? Can I help you? Will you all let me help you? Get five more minutes. Can I help you? Can I tell you how to get your mind on things that are right? Come on. Can I tell you how to do it? All right. When you get alone and the enemy starts messing with you, put on some crab family. Put on some crab family. Start listening to the day the lamb became the lion and the lion became the king. You won't find him again at the whipping post standing there so meek and he won't be nailed to a rugged cross through his hands and through his feet. There'll never be another Calvary because he don't have to prove one thing. The day the lamb became the lion and the lion became the king. Come on, if you want to get your mind off things, you go when you have some downtime, turn you on some third day. Come on, turn you on casting crowns. Get some good Holy Ghost filled music going through your spirit and your mind will not wander in places it shouldn't be. When my mind starts to wander, I put on some good Holy Ghost preaching like some T.D. Jakes. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, ain't nobody can get you fired up like T.D. Jakes. Amen. When I go preach somewhere, they say, you ain't black, but you got some chocolate in you somewhere. They did. You white chocolate. I'm going to do ancestry one day that thing. I guarantee you there's something in me because I like listening to some Kurt Franklin all oh, man, you get me going on some of that stuff. Woo, buddy. I'm telling you, when you get some good Holy Ghost filled music, it'll get your mind off everything you're not supposed to think about. <coughs> if you allow your mind to wander, it's never a good thing. And I had to learn to discipline myself. Romans 12, 1. I beseech your brethren by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to get your mind right. The only way I know to keep my mind renewed is to keep it filled with the things of God in my car, in my office, wherever. Whew. So much to do here. So much to say. I've got to skip a whole bunch of stuff. I've got to skip a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm going to kick myself for doing this, but let me just move on to my last point here. Sin. Nobody talks about this. Nobody talks about this. 
This is something people don't like to talk about anymore, but I want to cover this quickly. If there's something in your life that you know needs to come out, I mean, you know you need freedom from it, you're not going to feel good. You're not going to feel good. You're going to feel a word called conviction. A couple of issues the church today has is we don't mention sin. We call it misjudgments and mistakes. Mm -hmm. The second problem I see is we don't understand the difference between conviction and condemnation. I, I feel like everybody's looking funny at me at that church, and they're condemning me. Listen, if somebody ever comes to you and says something in condemnation, you come get me, and we will go talk to them together. You want to know why? Somebody say, why? Because this is the church of the imperfect. This is the first church of the imperfect. Starting at the pulpit, we are all saved by nothing but grace in this building. Conviction is that feeling you get inside that says, I need to get this right, and I know I need to get this right. Why can't I get past these thoughts? Every time I try to do something, I keep coming back to that same thing. That is conviction. God is telling you that you've got to, to, to get this uh, uh, took care of and get it under the blood. It is God making your spirit aware uh, that your flesh is contrary to his spirit. Sin and shame will carry such guilt. It carries such guilt many times and it leads to life of depression and oppression. People don't want, I need meds. No, what you need is deliverance. Come on. Maybe you do have a chemical imbalance. Maybe there is something that does need some meds, but listen to me. If you're cheating on your husband or your wife and looking at porn all day, you need deliverance, not meds. And when you get your, wife, your, your life straight, you won't feel conviction and sin will be under the blood and you will feel good inside. Jeremy, if you could come and stop me. I know they're probably in the back of me right now. I need to probably slow down here. I've had several who have come to me over the years struggling with oppression and depression and the only thing they needed to do was repent. They didn't need meds. They didn't need deliverance. I'm possessed by a devil, pastor. I can't quit doing this. Listen. There's a difference between possession and oppression. You can't sit in a bar all day and feel good about Jesus. You can't. Mm -hmm. And what they needed to hear was, you don't need deliverance and meds. You need to repent and stop doing what you know isn't right. And until you do, it's going to eat at you like cancer from the inside out. And you're going to live that life of depression and captivity. And I just want to stop here and tell you that Jesus loves you. He does. He loves you, and he don't want you to live like that. You may be a leader. You may be just a church member, but hear me. If you're tired of living under the guilt and shame, Jesus can uh, forgive you and heal your mind and restore everything the Bible said that the locust and the canker worm have eaten. He can restore your life. Paul stoned Stephen. Paul had Christians arrested and killed, and the Bible said he caused them to blaspheme. He did all kinds of ugly things, but listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7. Paul said, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit for perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. <laughs> Did you see that? Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Paul. What do you mean you have wronged nobody? You killed Stephen. You were there holding his coat while they stoned him. You've had Christians killed. You've had them in prison. You caused them to blaspheme or you would kill them. What do you mean, Paul, that you've wronged nobody? And then Paul comes back with this. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things that are ahead. That He said, you know what he was saying? He was saying, boys, that was Saul of Tarsus who did those things. But thank God. God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I've been changed and I am no longer Saul of Tarsus, but I am Paul the Apostle, and there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Got to stop, I got to stop, I got to stop. Luke 4, Jesus is in. The wilderness, the Bible said, and I, I'm just going to paraphrase, I'll get away from my scriptures. Jesus is in the wilderness where the Bible said the Spirit uh, led him to, and he was hungry, and he was fasting, and the Bible said that the enemy came to him, and the enemy said, uh, I'll take you to the top of this pinnacle, and you throw yourself off there, and if the Lord loves you, you won't get hurt. 
Satan was daring Jesus, the Son of God, to commit suicide. If God really loves you, if you're really God's son, do it. If you're really God's son, go ahead and do it. Let's see what happens. If God really loves you, pull the trigger. You won't die. If God really loves you, take those pills. You won't die. The maniac of Galdera had 2,000 demon spirits in him, and he lived in a graveyard, and he cut himself with stones and cried day and night. He was not sleeping because he was being tormented. Let me just go ahead and say this to some parents in here today. If you have a child who is cutting themselves, that is a precursor to the spirit of suicide. Read it in the Bible. It's in there. It's in the Bible. Jesus, please come help us. My son throws himself in the fire and water. Why? Why does his son throw himself in the fire and the water? Because the enemy wanted to kill him. The enemy wanted him to come. It didn't say the enemy threw him in there. It says he threw himself in there. Why would he want him to burn or drown? Because he wanted to have him killed. The enemy's plan is to abort the call of God on our lives. The enemy's plan is to stop you and I from touching the lives of people we are supposed to touch. Let me tell you this quick story, and I'll stop here. I'll close my iPad. I'll shut all my notes off. I've skipped half of them. Let me just stop here. Perry Stone told this story of a church he pastors in Cleveland, Tennessee, that one of the members of his church, (coughs) excuse me, Um, young lady struggling with severe depression and she was 20 years old and she drove her car up through Gatlinburg and went over a guardrail and drove, drove over top of it on purpose sped up, hit the guardrail, the car went over a cliff and went down the cliff about 100 feet the paramedics got to her and she was dead they revived her worked and worked and worked to revive her when they found her. They revived her. She woke up a week or two later in the hospital. Perry Stone and his wife and their prayer team had been praying and this is, this is the stuff that he talks about. He said, I asked her what was going on and she said, Pastor, the craziest thing I've ever had happen in my life happened. She said, I wanted to commit suicide because my boyfriend broke up with me and I just didn't feel any need to live anymore. So she said, I purposely drove over that cliff and while I drove over that cliff, she said it was like a bad dream. I saw this big lake of fire. She said, and there were two faces, a little boy and a little girl's face that kept coming up and looking at me. And she said, I asked in the dream, she said it was like a dream. And she said, I asked, Who are, who's that little boy and little girl? And she said, a boy spoke to me and said, that's your son and your daughter that you're supposed to have. But because you're trying to take your own life, you'll never have them. She woke up two weeks later in the hospital. They led her to Christ. She was totally delivered from depression. Five years later, she has a little boy and a little girl, and she's happily married you can't make that stuff up why am I talking about this today we have people sitting in this church our youth director would know more than anybody youth that sit in this church every week that has kids that are struggling with cutting themselves kids that are struggling with wanting to commit suicide we had them at youth camp Confessing, I was going to commit suicide and I had it all planned out. But because of what happened at camp, I feel like there's a renewed, remember, hope deferred, hope for long periods of time where you don't feel it, it makes your heart sick. There's people in this church right now, you're so miserable in your marriage that you smile and you post your best pictures. But inside, you can't stand it. And sometimes you wish and wish and wish things could just come to an end. Somebody asked me the other day, if you commit suicide, do you go to heaven? You know what? I'm not getting into that conversation. 
I'm just not going to get into that one. I'm not going to try it and find out. My wife came to me because there's an epidemic right now of pastors that are killing themselves. It is epidemic. The last one affected me so greatly. I, I mean, it put me into a, into a haze for a few days. This, watching the pictures his wife was posting on Instagram of his three babies standing at his coffin. Pastor, 15,000 people. My wife came to me and she said, if you ever feel like that, come to me. We don't need ministry that bad. We can get you help. We don't ever do, don't ever do something like that. Don't do that to your kids and your grandkids and to me. Don't do that. There are some, uh, some folks in here today, and I know if I gave an altar call, this would be a tough one. There's folks in here today that you're struggling with the same thing because you think life is better off without you. I could come get three of you out of your seat right now. The Lord's had me make eye contact with you several times during this message, and you've wondered the whole time, is he talking to me? See, the Lord's confirming to you right now that he was talking to you. here by accident says God I called you from your mother's womb and you are mine and I know your name I did not bring you this far to leave you now I am here to set you free from that oppressive spirit that you have lived with for years my grace is sufficient in this time of need you stand with me all around here just stand with me for just a minute let me take care of this first we don't do offering we have pedestals at the exits and entrances if legacy church is your home and you want to bless the church please support us with your tithe and offering want to do this because there are some folks in here today the oppressiveness and the depression has gotten so heavy that you don't know how much more you can carry you smile and put on a good front for people but that, that heaviness has gotten almost too much to bear I want you to know that Jesus loves you yes he does he loves you and if you're in here today and you're struggling I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. It's going to take a lot to respond to an altar call like this. And you know what? If you don't, I've got their plans. I'm, I'm more than happy to leave. But I really feel like God's talking to some folks in here today. That depression, that oppressiveness is getting so heavy. It's getting so heavy. We just want to take it to the Lord and leave it there. We just want to take it to the Lord and leave it there. Come on. Nobody's going to look at you funny. Nobody's going to look at you funny. Come on. If you don't want to come home, grab somebody by the hand. Ask them, would you come pray with me, please? Just grab by the hand and say, would you come pray with me, please? Without your word on my lips, there is nothing. church. I don't, care if, I don't care if you're on a prayer team or not. Would you help me pray? Come on, there's a lot of people around here. There's still a couple more you need to come. come on, there's still a couple more. Come on, would you come help me pray? Come on. Move in your power Like royal poured out Onto my feet
flame, be the spark, be the fire in my heart. All I want, all consuming. Lord, be the dismissed you can be dismissed please fellowship in the foyer but i want to say to you there's a couple more that need to come god's talking to you don't leave here don't leave here needing that if you fellowship please do that out there i love you god bless you i'll see you